This show is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. When life gets hard, talking to someone can help, whether it's venting, processing, or getting tools to deal with stress. Visit betterhelp.com super and lighten the load. Hey, brother. What if Harry Potter was sorted into Slytherin. Last week, we began our journey down one of the most asked questions in the entire Harry Potter fandom. What if Harry had just not asked the Sorting Hat to not put him in Slytherin? Which, by the way, this video will probably make a lot more sense if you've seen the first one, but no pressure. But in a nutshell, the results thus far have been kind of surprising in that Harry still ends up best friends with Ron and Hermione. He still plays Seeker, albeit for the Slytherin Quidditch team. Draco still hates him, and he still took on Voldemort at the end of year one. All in all, book one stuck fairly close to the original, but how will Harry fare in year two? Because Chamber is the book that focuses pretty heavily on Harry's own internal struggle with this exact question. The heir of Slytherin is on the loose, and Harry is pretty concerned that it's him when he's in Gryffindor. I mean, how do you think he's gonna fare when he's in Slytherin? And do you think he'll still be able to use the sword? Well, today we find out what would have happened in Chamber of Secrets if Harry Potter had been sorted into Slytherin. You would have done well in Slytherin. Okay, so last we left our hero, he was headed on the train back home to the Dursleys after having defeated Voldemort through the end of his first year and won Slytherin the House Cup. And the big repercussion here is that any support Harry might have been getting from Death Eaters who thought maybe Harry was a dark wizard they could all rally behind is now gone. As Dumbledore says at the end of the first book, what happened between Harry and Quirrell was a complete secret. And so naturally the whole school and therefore the entire wizarding world knows. Which importantly means that the events in Chamber still get set in motion by Lucius Malfoy, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's get back to Harry at the Dursleys. For the most part, I think this goes down pretty much the same. Vernon is still trying to close a big drill deal with a Japanese golfer joke. Harry's still up in his room pretending he doesn't exist, and Dobby still shows up to ruin the whole thing. And Dobby, of course, is still in on everything because it's all stemming from Lucius, who he works for. Which means Dobby was still stopping Harry's mail, so the Weasley still come to break him out in the flying car. And while I think his time there is pretty much the same, it's also not. Because now you get to see just how open and accepting the Weasley family truly is, and how they accept Harry no matter what house he's in. But they still all go to Diagon Alley to meet Hermione, they still meet Lockhart, and most importantly, Lucius Malfoy still slips Ginny the diary. Lucius, of course, in this scenario, actually bought Harry his Nimbus 2000 last year, only for Harry to take down Voldemort again and prove that he is not a dark wizard. So he probably feels kind of foolish for having bought uh, Harry the Broom. Either way, though, that brings us to Platform 9 and 3 quarters, where Dobby still stops Harry and Fraun from getting through, so they still have to steal the car and still crash it into the Whomping Willow, where they are then intercepted by... Snape. And I'm not gonna lie, this was tricky to figure out because in the main storyline, Snape literally bemoans the fact that Harry and Ron are not in his house because if they were, he'd have them expelled. But in this scenario, Harry actually is in his house. So is he expelled? I don't think so. The fact is, even in the main storyline, he doesn't really want Harry expelled. He just likes making his life hard. And in this case, Harry is his star Quidditch player who won Slytherin in the House Cup last year. And make no mistake, and I'm dead serious here, Snape is a huge Quidditch hooligan and very much cares about winning. Plus, bear in mind, Snape's not really a Death Eater. He's just playing double agent. So his story to the Death Eaters here would just be that he had to be nice to Harry to keep Dumbledore fooled. But I do still think Harry and Ron both end up with detention because even in the main storyline, Dumbledore's like, yeah, if you do something like this again, I will have to expel you. Which like, yeah, right. Like Dumbledore is going to expel Harry. Can you imagine? But so the school year begins, and I have to imagine that the known for breaking the rules Slytherins are actually pretty impressed with Harry's entrance into the school, maybe except for Malfoy, Crabbe, and Goyle. But this sort of thing keeps him safe in the common room from those three, especially since Harry's the one who won the cup for the house last year. But speaking of Quidditch, this is the next big change because Harry being on the Slytherin Quidditch team means Draco is not. Meaning the rest of the Slytherins do not end up benefiting from the Nimbus 2001s gifted by Lucius Malfoy. Not that it really matters because they don't really need them because they've got Harry. But this does mean the interaction where Ron tries to curse Malfoy but his spell backfires and he's the one who ends up vomiting slugs doesn't happen at all. So Riley, Riley if you could just go ahead and play that scene in reverse. Thank you. <laughs> wow, somehow backwards was 
even worse. Uh -oh. But here's the other thing. Harry not being on the Gryffindor team means that the Gryffindor team has an opening at Seeker. And you know who I think tries out and gets it? Ron. Yes. We know he's interested in playing on the Quidditch team. I mean, even in the main storyline, the moment there's an opening, he tries out. Plus being second year now, he'd be eligible to make the team. And as a second year, he'd be very light and good at playing Seeker. Plus he's already got two brothers on the team, Fred and George, who could totally vouch for him. Hard to say if they would, but I think Ron makes it. And I think Professor McGonagall gets Ron a Nimbus 2000, which I know might sound a little bit out of character, but a couple things. First, if anyone's a bigger Quidditch hooligan in this school than Snape, it's McGonagall, and you know she hates losing to Slytherin. Plus, in the last book, Ron did beat her chess set, and while he did score some big points for Big Griff, he didn't actually end up winning the cup for them, so I think this would sort of be her like, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, well done, good job reward to Ron for that. And also go beat Potter. Anyway, Harry and Ron both have their detentions, which go down the exact same. Harry has to sign letters with Lockhart, where he still hears the Basilisk's voice for the first time. And Ron has to shine a bunch of trophies, but because he did not hit himself with the slug vomiting spell this time, he doesn't have to re-shine the Tom Riddle special services for the school award over and over. So he does not remember who TM Riddle is or that he won an award. The next big change that happens in the story though is kind of big and will definitely have very big repercussions down the line. Normally, Harry is coming back from Quidditch practice one day and is really muddy and gets mud all over the stairs and Filch is really mad at him. But fortunately for Harry, he is saved because nearly headless Nick convinces Peeves to go drop something big and loud upstairs and Filch runs off and Harry just doesn't get written up at all. But in this scenario, obviously Harry is on a different Quidditch team, so he wouldn't have been coming into the castle at that time. Also, as a Slytherin, he doesn't have a relationship with nearly headless Nick, so Nick would definitely not go organize some distraction on his behalf. But the fact that this doesn't happen is big because one, it means that Harry never learns that Filch is a squib. Two, it also means that Harry doesn't agree to go to the death day party as a thank you to Nick. And three, it means that whatever Peeves broke didn't end up getting broken. So um, what, what, what did he break? Oh yeah, the vanishing cabinet. I wonder if that'll be important later. But since Harry, Ron, and Hermione don't have to go to the death day party, it means they do go to the Halloween feast where Harry would just be sitting with all the Slytherins, meaning that Harry, Ron, and Hermione don't discover Mrs. Norris by themselves. Instead, they discover the cat at the same time the rest of the school discovers it. But since Harry isn't found at the scene of the crime like he normally is, and because he didn't find out that Filch was a squib, Filch doesn't immediately accuse him of murdering his cat in front of everyone, which means Harry isn't the immediate suspect like the entire school right out of the gate. Malfoy, on the other hand, just still real excited about the writing on the wall. You'll be next, mudbloods. That said, just because the school doesn't suspect Harry, doesn't mean Harry doesn't still suspect Harry, especially after Hermione learns everything she does about the Chamber of Secrets from Professor Binns and then tells Harry, and he adds that up with the voices he's hearing inside his head, and he's worried it was him somehow. Which I know might sound unlikely, like he knows he was at the feast, right? But even in the main story, when he's in Gryffindor and knows he didn't did it, he's, he's still not not sure it wasn't him somehow. Who am I, Hedwig? Plus, don't forget, in this scenario, he would have spent his first year trying to prove to a bunch of people who he was living with that he was not a dark wizard. And even though he proved them all wrong, the idea would still be fresh in his brain, not to mention he did defeat Voldemort with his bare hands last year, so I don't know, is is he dark? In any case, the Golden Trio still take it upon themselves to investigate the crime scene the next day where they do meet Moaning Myrtle anyway, which I guess maybe Hermione already knew her, but it's important that they meet her because Myrtle is obviously a big part of the puzzle. Normally they meet her at the death day party, but now it's delayed until here. But that brings us to our first Quidditch match of the year, Gryffindor versus Slytherin. But this time it's not Harry versus Draco, it's Harry versus Ron. Now, obviously Ron is gonna be just like super duper nervous for this match because that's just, you know, his regular MO with Quidditch anyway. But this is also his first game ever and it's against his best friend, the boy who lived and who also never lost, Harry Potter. Woohoo! How fun. So if I'm putting myself in Oliver Wood's shoes, I know two things about this match. One, my chasers are way better than the Slytherin chasers. And two, Harry is just, just way, way, way better than my very untested seeker 
Ron Weasley. Thus, Wood's only hope of winning this match is to try and slow Harry down as much as possible until his chasers have covered the 150 point gap. And how's he gonna do that? Fred and George, the best beaters Gryffindor's seen in years. Who, unbeknownst to them, are just gonna have a secret advantage in this match and that one of the bludgers is just bewitched to already be hunting Harry nonstop and maim and or seriously injure him. So the match begins and Oliver's strategy is working beautifully. The Gryffindor chasers are incrementally increasing their lead and Harry just can't catch a breath from the bludgers. Finally, one of his own beaters manages to knock the rogue bludger away, but it immediately changes course and hunts right back at Harry alerting him to the jinx. Harry, testing his theory, shoots across the field with the bludger chasing close behind. He does a quick 180 and loses it for a second. Ron notices this and asks why Harry is flying so unusually, and Harry explains that one of the bludgers is hunting him. But before they can do anything about it or call a timeout, Ron notices the snitch, and he's so excited he just forgets and blurts it out. Harry, snitch! And with the game suddenly on the line, the bludger is momentarily forgotten and both go racing after the snitch. Harry is in the lead. He can taste it. He is reaching out. He is about to grab the snitch when suddenly he sees the rogue bludger coming. He dodges it and gets back on course, but now Ron is closing in. Harry lowers himself to the broom. He shoots forward. He's neck and neck with Ron when wham! Fred or George, can't tell which one, hits the other bludger and sends it directly at Harry and connects, knocking him out cold. Ron catches the snitch! Griffin no wins! The stadium erupts and everyone thinks Ron is a hero. He beat Harry. Everyone, of course, except for Ron, who thinks he only won because of the rogue bludger. So classic Ron. Meanwhile, Harry wakes up later that night in the hospital wing with a sore head, but is awake enough to hear Colin Creevy arrive as the basilisk's next victim. The next day, Ron and Hermione come to check on him and point out that Draco wasn't actually at the match, allegedly because he didn't want to watch Potty and the Weasel. But conveniently, there was also an attack. <gasps> they all jump to the same conclusion that Malfoy must have had something to do with it, but Harry is also privately concerned that he was unconscious during the entire time Time that it happened and he's concerned he had something to do with it. But now we have to do a quick pause to give a big shout out to today's sponsor, MeUndies. Which you haven't heard about, you totally should. It's this like legendary underwear brand that is totally taking over my underwear drawer. But seriously, here at SCB, we love them. Cause when you're in a long recording session, like, you know, this one, I don't know if you've noticed, this video is a little longer than normal. The last thing you want to be worrying about is whether or not you're comfortable down in the underbridges area. And in that way, they're much more than undies. Because when I discovered me undies, I quickly decided it would be the only thing occupying space in my underwear drawer. Remember earlier when I said they were taking over? I lied. Invasion complete, they own it. But seriously, after you've worn something as breathable and soft as me undies, it's silly to wear anything else. Personally, I'm partial to the Potter printed boxer briefs. They're just so fun and magical. And while everyone probably knows me undies for their super soft undies and comfy bralettes, did you know they also make other stuff too? Like we're talking durable, cushy socks that will make your feet we're talking super stretchy loungewear. We're talking daily tees, shorts, and rompers that add a little silky softness to your every day. They even make hoodies for your dog so you can match every important person in your life. They're available in sizes XS to 4XL and have tons of colors and prints. Make MeUndies your destination for all things soft and sustainable. Plus, they have a great offer for our viewers. If you are a first time purchaser, you get 20% off your first order and free shipping and returns. So to get 20% off your first purchase, free shipping and a 100% satisfaction guarantee, head over to MeUndies.com slash theories. One more time, that's MeUndies.com slash theories. Link is in the description down below. Dueling club! I think for the most part, this pretty much goes down the same. Snape blasts Lockhart, pivotally teaching Harry Expelliarmus. Lockhart, of course, still pulls Harry on stage, but I think the main difference is that Malfoy just eagerly volunteers to come up on stage and duel Harry because now he recognizes this is finally his chance to beat Potter. Scared Potter. You wish. As such, Draco still summons the snake and Harry still accidentally reveals to the entire school that he can speak parcel mouth. So if Harry wasn't the prime suspect before, he is now. But now we come to another large difference the polyjuice potion. The whole reason they need the polyjuice potion in the main storyline is so that they can sneak into the Slytherin common room and question Malfoy. But now that's literally where Harry lives. And honestly, I don't even think he'd have to try hard to figure out that Draco isn't the heir because in the main storyline, Draco's pretty open about wanting to help whoever it is. Then you must have some idea who's behind it all. You know I don't coil. But beyond that, even if Draco was keeping all of that really close to the chest, 
Even he couldn't ignore the fact that Harry Potter was in Slytherin and could talk to snakes. Draco is absolutely cunning and opportunistic enough to realize Harry's air of Slytherinness. And I think that might actually trump his hatred of Harry, at least enough to directly ask him if he's the heir of Slytherin, and if so, what can he do to help? An offer that Harry would obviously rebuff, but one that would also make Harry feel even worse about himself. I mean, if Draco was willing to forgive the animosity between them, I mean, it must be just so obvious that it's him. Who am I, Hedwig? Anyway, the next big thing that happens is that Justin Finch Fletchley and Nearly Headless Nick both get attacked by the Basilisk, prompting Ginny to try and dispose of the diary in Moaning Myrtle's bathroom, which causes Myrtle to flood the bathroom and for Harry and Ron to go in and investigate why she She's flooding it where Harry discovers the diary, as usual. The only big difference about the way they find it this time is that Ron doesn't immediately recognize the name T.M. Riddle on the diary because he didn't have to spend an hour polishing that service to the school award. Nevertheless, though, the date of the diary is still there and they can still do the math to figure out that it's 50 years old and that it must have something to do with the Chamber of Secrets, which was opened 50 years ago. But since they don't know about Tom Riddle's award, they don't immediately assume he caught the culprit. Instead, they may have very well assumed it was Tom Riddle, but honestly, it doesn't doesn't matter, it doesn't stop Harry from writing it and learning what he does about how Hagrid got expelled, which is of course crucial information in this story. But before we continue, we need to address another holiday. Valentine's Day, because it is a very important day this year. If you will recall, on this Valentine's Day, Ginny goes about sending Harry possibly the most embarrassing Valentine's ever. In Harry's efforts to escape this embarrassing situation, he trips and spills all of his books on the floor, and Draco is there to scoop up the diary and hold it up for everyone to see, wondering aloud, what has Harry Potter written in his diary? And Ginny, who was actually the one who's been opening the chamber this whole time, sees everything everything that's going down and is horrified by the implications. But either way, Harry uses Expelliarmus on Draco, embarrasses him in front of everyone and gets the diary back. Now, normally this interaction prompts Ginny to stay behind the Gryffindor common room during the Gryffindor Hufflepuff Quidditch match. She sneaks up to the boys dormitory and steals the diary back from Harry, which is then when Hermione and Penelope get attacked. However, the big difference here is that Harry doesn't live in Gryffindor Tower. He lives in the Slytherin common room and Ginny doesn't have access to his dorm this time. So she can't steal the diary back. But do you know who does have ready access to Harry Potter's dormitory and now knows that Harry is hiding a secret diary? Draco Malfoy. Malfoy is instead the one who stays behind during the Quidditch match to rifle through Harry's things and steal the diary. It is then him who attacks Hermione and Penelope. Well, I say him, it's obviously Draco, possessed by Tom Riddle controlling the Basilisk. So. But I know what you're thinking. No, that wouldn't work because Ginny he had poured so much of herself into the diary. That's why the diary was able to control her. Draco would just be picking it up. And that's true, but the difference here is that Draco is hyper eager to help out the heir of Slytherin and has been very loud about it all year. As for me, I hope it's Granger. He hates Muggleborns and he hates Harry. And if you recall, Tom Riddle and the diary's main two goals are to kill Harry and to purge the school of Muggleborns. Anyway, this attack is what causes Hagrid to get arrested and Dumbledore to be removed of the school, which typically then prompts Ron and Harry to go into the woods to talk to Aragog to learn the truth about the Chamber of Secrets. And I think all that pretty much stays the same. They talk to Aragog and learn that Moaning Myrtle was the one who was killed 50 years ago and that Hagrid was actually innocent. But a big change does happen the very next day where usually Harry and Ron are able to trick Lockhart into abandoning his chaperoning duty so they can try and sneak up to the bathroom to talk to Myrtle. But before they can get to the bathroom, McGonagall catches them and they have to make up a lie that they were trying to go see Hermione, which they then have to go do, which is when they learn about the Basilisk. But if Harry is in Slytherin this year, then this opportunity doesn't arise because Harry and Ron wouldn't have had defense against the dark arts at the same time. But that's actually okay because it also that means that Harry would have been at the Slytherin table for breakfast that morning. And if you recall, that is an important breakfast because Ginny is about to tell Harry and Ron everything before Percy suddenly comes and interrupts her. But this time, Harry is over at the Slytherin table, probably eating by himself because everyone thinks he's the heir of Slytherin, and Ginny is able to come talk to him completely uninterrupted and tell him 
everything, including all the same information about the basilisk. So like usual, he gathers up Ron and the two of them sprint to the staff room to try and alert the teachers to tell them everything about what's been going on, but they're too late. The heir of Slytherin has taken someone into the chamber and left a new note. But obviously it's not Ginny this time that Tom Riddle took, it is instead Draco because he's the one with the diary. Ever the hero though, despite his hatred of Draco, he decides he's going to tell Lockhart everything he knows in a last ditch effort, maybe they can save him? Ron of course argues heavily against saving Draco, but concedes in the end. Then together, the three of them find the chamber. Lockhart loses his memory and Ron is trapped behind the wall, just like usual. And so Harry must proceed alone into the heart of the Chamber of Secrets to rescue Draco. Harry quickly finds Draco and Tom Riddle emerges and reveals his entire dastardly plot and summons the Basilisk to kill Harry. Harry, as ever, shows his immense loyalty to Dumbledore in the moment and is able to summon Fox to his aid in the chamber. As usual, Fox is a tremendous help and is able to blind the Basilisk, but, and this is huge, Fox does not bring the Sorting Hat. Or even if he does, it doesn't matter because this time Harry is in Slytherin and cannot pull the sword of Gryffindor from inside. Now, you might argue that if Harry could ever pull the sword in any timeline, he could always pull it in every timeline. Once a true Gryffindor, always a true Gryffindor, right? Wrong. Alas, this is not the story of Harry was meant to be in Gryffindor. It is the story of Harry is in Slytherin. And as a Slytherin, he cannot pull the sword. Granted, we have seen other Slytherins handle the sword. Bellatrix holds it in Malfoy Manor and Snape is able to place it in the pool for Harry and or Ron to retrieve, but neither of them actually summoned the sword to themselves and neither of them actually tried to use it as a sword. And if they had, it wouldn't have worked. Full video by clicking the card. But okay, so then Harry doesn't have the sword. The Basilisk is about to strike. Does Harry just die? Does the Basilisk kill him? Of course not. Now in the movies, Tom says, Parcel mouth won't help you now, Potter. The Basilisk only listens to me. But in the book, he never actually says that out loud and Harry just never even tries to talk to the Basilisk. And the whole sentiment here is that only the heir of Slytherin would actually be able to control the Basilisk, not just anyone who could speak Parcel mouth. But here's the thing. The diary is just a horcrux with a piece of Voldemort's soul inside, which is apparently enough to count as the heir of Slytherin. And I have news for you guys. Harry is a horcrux too, and therefore should also be able to control the basilisk with the literal exact same power. In fact, even in the main story, that should and would have worked. Harry just never tries to communicate it, but now, he doesn't have a sword. So facing down death, the basilisk strikes and Harry acting purely on instinct shouts out, stop in parcel mouth. And much to him and Tom's surprise, it does. And now instead of a sword fight, everyone's fate comes down to who can convince the basilisk to listen to them. Tom is of course furious and screams for obedience. Harry, unsure why the Basilisk is listening, tries to press his advantage and argues back. No, he shouts, I'm not your enemy. I don't want to hurt you. Your master, Salazar Slytherin, wanted to purge the school of Muggleborns. He believed in pure blood supremacy, but he's wrong. You've been listening to him all year, but he's just told me that he's a half-blood and so am I. Liar! Riddle screams. It's true, he is a half-blood, and look who he's brought to the chamber to sacrifice for himself, a pure blood Slytherin, Draco Malfoy. Listen to me, you great idiot snake. Please, this boy hates me, but I came here to save him. And then the basilisk lunges, but not at Harry or at Tom, instead at the diary itself, demolishing it and Riddle. Draco immediately awakes, afraid for his life. Potter, what are you doing here? Saving you from that, he says, motioning to the diary. And that, he says, motioning to the basilisk. Draco reels back in fear at the sight of the basilisk, but the basilisk just whimpers, its eyes still horribly injured. Thank you, Harry hisses out to the basilisk. Thank you for saving us. And thank you, Fox. And then, as usual, Fox begins to cry, but this time he's not healing Harry, he was, of course, uninjured this time around, but instead heals the basilisk's eyes. Upon healing, the basilisk immediately whips its head around and fixes Harry with its gaze. Harry is afraid, but just for a second as he notices he's unharmed and then 
he understands. The tears have healed the basilisk's vision, but not its deadly gaze. The basilisk nods to Harry in thanks, and the two share an unspoken understanding that the basilisk will not harm anyone again, and then it retreats back into Slytherin's statue. Back up at the school, as ever, Dumbledore, Lucius, and Dobby are waiting for them. Draco is still in a state of complete shock and says nothing. Whilst Lucius is a confusing mix of guilt-ridden, angry, and grateful, he's of course upset that his plan was thwarted by Harry Potter, but he's also pretty guilt-ridden that it was his plan that also almost killed his son, but then also kind of grateful to Harry for saving his son. This prompts Lucius to offer Harry a favor, which Harry immediately tries to cash in, asking him to free Dobby. Lucius, however, does not find this to be a fair trade. He is enraged and turns to leave. But as he walks towards the door, Draco removes his own sock and gives it to Dobby. Master has given Dobby a sock. He then gives Harry a very curt thanks and leaves. And that is basically it. Harry ends the year finally understanding that Slytherin House is not synonymous with evil, that it's not intrinsically bad. Instead, it's all about the choices you make. Voldemort may have given Slytherin House a bad name, but that doesn't mean that he, Harry, is bad. And he, Harry, decides that he is going to change it. Oh, and also, Slytherin wins the House Cup! Again, nine years in a row. That's a good streak. Harry and Ron would, of course, get the same 200 points they normally get for going down into the chamber. But in a twist of fate, it is actually Draco who ends up scoring the winning points for Slytherin this time around. Because, I mean, come on, if Neville would get points up for standing up to his friends, I think Draco would absolutely get some points for standing up to his own family and freeing a slave. Don't you? But there you go, guys. That's what happens in year two if Harry was instead sorted into Slytherin. Make sure you tune in next week and click that bell so you don't miss what happens next. I mean, here's something to consider. Uh, Harry now has a pet basilisk. Guys, thanks so much for watching today's video. If you want to see another big seven part series like this, I would recommend Dumbledore's big plan right here. But otherwise, until next time, Ben, I will see you in another life, brother.